If you have your Bibles with you, I may ask if you would to turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, as a matter of fact, that's where we started last week when we started the first week of Advent. And we talked about hope, and we talked about that hope was the, the extension of faith into the future. Hope is the trust and belief that God will fulfill what he has promised. And on the second week of Advent, we're talking about faith. We now turn to that. And the Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we're only going to read one verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let's go Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you once again that we have the opportunity to gather in this place this day. Father, I thank you for the praise team. I thank you that the how they lead us in worship and and, and God, how today I can feel and sense the Holy Spirit in this place. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that today the Holy Spirit would choose to save somebody, God. I pray that today they may turn to you and that, Lord Jesus, they may realize among all, above all things that you are real, that you love them, and that you sent your only begotten Son, that if they may put their faith in him, they shall never die. God, that is the only hope we have. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible teaches us that without faith, it is impossible, cannot happen to please God. You have to have faith. Faith is the fuel that the human spirit runs on. Now, we try to fill our spirits with a lot of other stuff. You know, we try to find happiness in so many different areas. You know, we may try popularity, want to be the most popular person at our school or our job or someplace else. Or we may try prosperity. We may try uh, pleasure. We may try power. But what we find is that when we try to fill our spirits with these things, it's just never enough. It's almost like there's a hole in our cup and, and whatever we fill it with, it just keeps leaking out, right? It's never enough. And for those of you who are here today that are truly child, children of God, that are truly saved, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because I don't think you can come to Christ until you probably try a whole bunch of other things, you know? You just try so many other things to, to quench that hunger, uh, that, that thirst that's in your spirit. You've tried so many different things, but nothing ever really fulfills. And I don't have to experience all these things to know they don't fulfill all I have to do is read the news. I, I can see as people are seeking after this power and this popularity and this prestige and, and, and pleasure that it just doesn't get them where they want to go because we see so many of them. And drug overdoses who are celebrities and, and rock stars and people who commit suicide because it's simply not enough. What happens is it creates in us when we try to use something else besides faith to quench the uh, thirst in our soul, what happens is, is that it just creates in us an appetite for more. It's just never enough, is it? It's never enough. You think, well, once I get that new car, I'll arrive. Once I get that uh, new girlfriend or boyfriend, once I get that new husband or wife, once I get a little money in my bank account, once I get my career established, then I'm going to be satisfied and I'm going to be happy. And every time you cross that milestone or get to that milestone, you're looking for another milestone to go to. It's like chasing a rabbit that you can never catch. It's just impossible to find what you're looking for because the world doesn't offer it. That's why I'm, I can preach boldly. That's why I can proclaim boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ because I know when I speak of this, this, this unprincipled thirst, I'm speaking to everybody. I can say the same thing to, to Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Nothing in the world satisfies, and you should know that because you've been at the pinnacle of power. Nothing but Jesus satisfies. Now, it would be great in fact, we realized that what we were doing never really satisfied, that, that we would stop and just, you know, turn to Christ. But unfortunately, too many of us have to go through and wade through all the pain and the struggle of life in order to understand what I'm saying to you right now. Faith is the only way that we can find peace with God. 
Now, the Greek word for faith is the word pistuo, which means, which is a verb. Now, we don't have a, a faith in the English language is a noun. And so oftentimes, the word is translated a noun in the English language, in, when we read our English Bibles. But too often times, or many times, because of the King James Bible's influence upon the modern Bibles we have now, the word pistuo is translated believed in. And so when you read like John 3.16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him. Well, the word really there, believes in, is the word pistuo, or faith. But we don't have a way in the English language to say he faithed him, and so we use the word believed in. Now, before getting into what faith is, I want to really quickly talk about what faith is not. <clears throat> because faith is not a simple belief that God exists. Now, if uh, I were to ask you today, if you have faith in God, you may say yes. Because you think that all faith means is to believe that there is a God out there. But James does away with this argument in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 19, when James says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. See, the Bible teaches that the demons believe that there's a God. And so if all you're depending on for your salvation or anything else or deliverance is that God exists, then you're not gonna, you don't really have faith yet. You have that belief that God can, but you're not so sure that God will. Satan is a 100% believer that God exists. So obviously... Faith is more than a simple belief. Faith is more than simply accepting a set of beliefs or doctrines. You cannot be saved. You will not go to heaven just because you believe that God exists. Secondly, faith does not care about the sincerity of your beliefs. You see, the number one antagonist today, the number one enemy of real Christianity is not Satanism. It's not even hedonism. It's not even an organi another organized religion. <clears throat> the greatest attack today on real Christianity is relativism. And what relativism teaches us is that truth is relative. And as long as you're sincere in your beliefs, it doesn't really matter what you believe. And, and I talk to people, and I'm sure you have too, sometimes about faith or about what you believe. And, and as you talk about your belief, you'll find them come up with all kinds of weird and, and crazy beliefs. And they somehow think that because they believe this sincerely, that makes it true. But let me say this, there are people out there, even today in the 21st century, that believe the world is flat. They do. They believe it sincerely. They'll get up, if you don't believe it, go on YouTube and, and Google, is the world flat? And there's going to be somebody up there explaining to you why no one ever went to the moon and why the world is flat. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories about everything. But it doesn't matter about the sincerity of your belief that simply does not make it true. I used to believe in the tooth fairy. I used to believe in the Easter Bunny. And I was very sincere in that belief. Matter of fact, if somebody uh, said it wasn't so, then I would argue with them. But the sincerity of my belief was not based upon reality or truth. And, and belief that is not based upon reality or truth is nothing more that a good lie. I'm so tired of people telling me what they believe. Because the sincerity of your belief does not make it true. Faith is also not a simple belief that God can do something. You can believe with all your heart that God created the world in six days. You can believe in all your heart with all your heart that, that God came down and, and was conceived into a virgin named Mary and was born in Bethlehem. And as the young lady saying while ago, uh, that Mary had this little baby that could heal blind folks and make uh, lame folks walk and deaf folks hear, you can believe that. You can believe that with all your heart. You can believe with all your heart that Jesus was crucified and died from your sin and rose from the grave after three days. You can have all of those beliefs, but faith is more than what you believe. As I said, even Satan believes that. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Scriptures, if you notice, too many people are depending 
upon their eternal salvation on belief of a set of doctrines. Beliefs that may have simply been passed down to them from generation to generation without simply receiving the truth themselves. You may depend upon the fact that your granddaddy was a preacher, you know, your daddy was a deacon. You may depend upon the fact that you're surrounded here by the gospel. You can't turn on the television or the radio. And so maybe that influenced you to believe the things you believe. But faith is more than what you believe. And that's why Jesus knew this was going to happen. That's why over and over in Scripture, on the last days, when these people were standing before Jesus at the end of the age, they said to Jesus, Lord, let us in. We prophesied in your name. We went to church every Sunday. We were preachers. We were deacons. We, we went to church. We sang in a praise band. And Jesus looked at them and says, Depart from me. I never knew you. They were deceived. Deceived. Their eternal salvation simply was based upon a belief system and not what real faith is. You know, you can believe whatever you want to. The sincerity of your beliefs don't matter. There's one truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. The Bible says there's one name under heaven by which men can be saved. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about the parable of the wheat and the tares. Wheat and tares, they look alike until they're gathered up at the harvest. And then the head is cracked open and you can tell which is the wheat and which is the tare. And Jesus compares that to the end of the age with people who are coming before him and they look like Christians, they talk like Christians, they act like Christians, but they weren't Christians. And today, somebody may have made you come to church. Somebody may have manipulated you to be here, or you may have been here out of some other reason, maybe a, a little pain or guilt. I don't know why you're here today. You may have come simply because you love Jesus, and that's awesome that you be here. But the fact is, one day what I'm talking to you about right now will be the most important thing anybody could ever in the history of mankind talk to you about. Have, have you placed your faith in Christ? And if you haven't, it is impossible to please God. And you will, I'm going to sound very country, very dogmatic here. If you have not placed your faith and trust in Christ, you will go to hell. Amen. You will. Separated from all eternity from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will be your choice. I remember I was. That was back when I was in college, which was oh, about what, that three years ago, four years ago now. Back when I was in college, there was this exchange student from Sweden who used to ride to school with me. He uh, he'd grown up in Covington, and uh, when I had grown up, but he'd come from Sweden and he'd stay with the family in Covington. So he would ride back and forth to school with me to the union where I went to school on the weekends. We'd come home and we'd ride. And one day uh, I was talking to him on the way home, and he said. Wait, he said, uh, tell me about Jesus. You know, uh, he uh, Union was a Baptist school, and so he had heard about Jesus, and he had roommates that were Christians. He said, what does it mean to be a Christian? So, man, I said, I'm glad you asked me that. So I, I, all the way home, an hour drive, man, I explained to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. I explained to him how Jesus came and how he how he served us and how he went to the cross and how he bled and how he died for our sin and telling him at the very end after I had, had preached this hour long message on, on the grace of God man I'll be honest with you I thought I was good I mean I had him I just had him I had laid out the plan of salvation I talked about being a sinner I talked about the wages of sin is dead I talked about how uh, Jesus took those wages of sin of death upon himself on that cross and that if you just place your faith and trust in him, it, uh, you could have eternal life. And then I asked myself, I said, are you ready to give your heart and your life to Christ? I mean, that was good. I mean, it was one of my best sermons. Priest. And after I preached that sermon to him, he looked at me and he said, that's the boringest thing I've ever heard. Kind of, kind of ran all over me, man. I mean, I thought I'd been good. I thought it was good. You know? 
Some of you folks in here probably think, oh, this church is boring. It's so boring. It's not exciting enough. You know? It's okay, you know? It kind of flew all over me. When it flew all over me, I kind of got in the flesh a little bit, you know? And I looked at him and I said, I'll tell you what, brother. I said, there's going to come a day when this little boring story I told you will be the most important story anyone ever told you. When you're looking at the casket of that mom or that dad, and you know you're seeing their face for the very last time. And as you're looking at them, you're wondering in your heart and mind where they are right now. Are they in heaven or are they in hell? And he said, well, wait, I don't really want to go to hell. And I said, you don't have to. Well, he didn't get saved that day. But a few weeks later, he did. And I remember this guy, he, he, he actually had a chance to share his testimony after a few months in the chapel of Union University. And that was a big deal. I mean, because all the students, you know, from the campus, we had to do those chapels were there. And that place was packed that day because everybody loved Gunner. And that thing was packed. And I remember Gunner talking about, as he shared his testimony, he said, said I wouldn't be saved today. And Wade Wallace not told me I was going to hell. Now, I want to climb under the pew at the time. But, oh. but you know, sometimes we just need to tell folks the truth. And that's the truth. That may be boring to you today, but the fact is, without faith, you're going to hell. That's the way it is. At least that, according to the scripture. And I cannot stand beside the casket of someone who's, who's passed on, and I cannot stand beside their family of someone who has placed their faith and trust in Christ and tell them that they're going to heaven or that one day you'll see them again, if I can't say also that those who have never placed their faith and trust in Christ, you will never see again. That's harsh. Today that's definitely politically incorrect. But it's the truth. It's the truth. You see, what is faith? If it's not just a belief. Well, faith is like a two-sided coin. On one side of the coin, you have belief. Yes, you have to believe there is a God. You have to believe that God exists. And that's what the Bible just said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, first thing about faith is they have to believe that God exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So you have to believe that God exists. But there's the other side of the boy. And, and to me, it's the side that's most neglected in our culture today. And that is faith is trust. It's trust. You see, <clears throat> it's trusting that God loves us and wants the best for us. It's not only the belief that God can do something, but the trust that God will keep his promises. You see, faith is only faith when it becomes really an action or a risk. Now, for example, <clears throat> gamblers at the casinos or sports gambling especially, have faith in their teams, don't they? They believe that Alabama's going to win the football game yesterday or somebody's going to win the basketball game. And, and, and how much money they put on the, on the team is equivalent to how much they believe in that team, right? If we were certainly certain, and I've actually used this here before, so I won't use it again, but we have a lot of Alabama fans that go to church here. And <clears throat> so I oftentimes ask them, I say, how much do you think Alabama's going to win? I know Alabama's going to win. I know Alabama's going to win. I say, okay, how much you want to bet? You want to bet $10? Oh, man, yeah, I'll take your $10 bet. Easy money. How about $100? Yeah, 100 How about 1000 How about 10000 you see, how much faith you have in that team is equivalent to how much you're willing to risk, right? Maybe at first for $10, we're absolutely certain. But for $10,000, we're not quite so sure, right? Mother Teresa <clears throat> used to work the dirty streets of Calcutta, India. She was a Catholic nun who... Uh, went out and she dealt with the 
downtrodden, the sick among the, the street people of this very, very impoverished place. Now, Mother Teresa's group of nuns, they call something, what are they? Yeah. They call a little group of nuns. They wore uh, their outfits. They had no pockets in them. And the reason they had no pockets in them is because they may be tempted one day to pick up something and put it in their pocket. Like I do. My pockets are full. So, but they had made a vow to never possess anything. And so they chose poverty and they chose to never possess anything. Now, how many of you have heard of Mother Teresa? Raise your hand. Okay, most of you, just about all of you have heard of Mother Teresa. So I will guarantee you that had Mother Teresa chosen to be a public speaker, she probably could have charged $50,000 for speech, if not more, maybe $100,000. Because, I mean, she spoke in front of world leaders. Presidents knew her name. Leaders of other countries knew her name because of her reputation as a servant of God. She gave up all the worldly things because she believed that what she could attain in this life was nothing in comparison to what she could have in the next life. So she gave up all the worldly stuff. You see, Mother Teresa, when it came to how much did she bet on Jesus, she bet it all. She risked it all. Now I want to ask you a question. How much do you bet on Jesus? How much are you willing to risk? Some of us aren't even willing to risk 10 bucks. Oh, we'll show up because we have the right belief system, but how much are you willing to risk? How much are you willing to lay on the line? You see, the definition of biblical faith is defined as a total trust and a dependence upon God. It's an action where we let go and say, God, here it is. You do with my life what you want to do with my life. It can be summed up, faith can be summed up really in this little quote. Thy will be done. Not my will, but thine. You see, that is what real faith is. Real faith is trusting God to take care of us in all areas of our life. It's trusting God to take care of us when the husband walks out. Even though we pray for the husband to stay. It is trusting God when we love the person that they left us anyway. It's trusting God when we work harder than anyone else around us to get that promotion. But yet it was given to somebody else. It's trusting God when we really want to have a baby. We've been trying for years. But we still haven't had success. It is, I really wanted to get married, but now I'm turning 50 and I'm still not married. I'm 40s. Some of you relate. But still trusting God. It's saying, God, I know what I want, and you know what I want, but God, that will be done. How much are we willing to risk? Faith is trusting God with every part of our life. It's not just trusting God. See, there's must faith. Must faith is, I got to trust God on certain things, right? I mean, I got to because I already know I can't control it. I have to trust God that he's going to take me to heaven when I die. Can you control that? No. You got to trust him. I mean, you can't manipulate your way into that. But real faith, deep faith, is trusting God with what you could control and choosing not to control it anyway. Have you ever thought about that? It's, 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 I, could, I could change this. I could manipulate this. I could make this happen. But I'm not so sure that's biblical. I'm not so sure that's right. And so I'm going to just trust God with this and not do it. 
I'm gonna tell you what, I got I got a lot of addicts and alcoholics in this room who are in recovery. Thank you, Jesus, that they are. Thank you, God. They had a lot of faith. Somewhere along the way, they said, God, I I I can't do this by myself. I can't quit drinking, I can't can't quit using drugs. So God, I, I'm gonna you got to take this desire of drugs and drink it away from me. Great faith. But let me tell you who has better faith than you. Those who never drank and drugged at all. Because they trusted God without having to use drugs and alcohol. They trusted God not to start it. They said, God, I know you don't want me to do that, so I won't. And that's what real faith is. Real faith is making the decision to give your heart and your life over to the care of Jesus and taking your hands off of it for a while. It's saying, God, those are not my kids. They're yours. God, this is not my money. It's yours. God, it's not my job. It's yours. God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Wherever you want me to be, I'll be. You know, Jesus didn't hide his scars to win friends. He came, people came to him and said, Jesus, I, I, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus looked at him and said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus looked at great crowds that were following him and said, Hold! Before you follow me, you better understand that to follow me means you got to hate your father and mother and wife and kids and brothers and sisters also. If you want to follow me, you got to pick up a cross and die yourself. Oh, well, we preach this easy gospel today, but all you got to do is walk an aisle and be baptized. That's not the gospel Jesus preached. The gospel Jesus preached was you have to lay it all down. Die to yourself and follow me. That's the faith that we live by in the present and the faith that takes us into eternity with him. Now, some of you today have tried all the things and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Well, today is a good day for you because today is the day you can practice faith. Today is the day you can lay it all down. Whatever's robbing you of your peace, you can give it to Jesus. Whether it's that new job you're wanting or that new life, lay it down. Say, God, I'm going to be obedient to you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to get in the back seat. I'm going to put you in the driver's seat. And God, wherever you want to take me, I want to go. Let me tell you what. There is a blessedness in possessing nothing. There's a blessedness in controlling nothing. There's a blessedness in just jumping in the river and let the river carry you where it wants to carry you, knowing that God is in control of the river and he's trying to take you to the place you always wanted to be at. Just let it go. Let it go and let God. Just float. You know, is Christianity hard or easy? Well, it's hard in the sense that you got to die to self. It's very easy to just, once you let it go. And there's a peace in it. There's a peace in not trying to control your wife and your husband and your kids and your, and your job and, your, and trying to manipulate everything and everybody and, and trying to get your own way and trying to move up the corporate ladder and, and, and all that. Just let it go. God's got you. And it's all based upon the very thing we talked about at the beginning, John 3, 16, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son for you. And if God who gave his only son for you did not spare his own son, was not free to give you all things. He's got you. He's not out to destroy you. He's out to get you where you've always wanted to go and didn't even know you wanted to go there. Wow. You know, how many times does the Bible say, fear not? We're going to be reading the scripture for long where the shepherds are keeping watch over the flocks by night and the angel of the Lord appeared and they say, fear not. Because, you know, doubt is not really the opposite of fear, of, of faith. Fear is. The fear of letting go. The fear. Being afraid. And what are you afraid of? You're afraid that God doesn't love you? You're afraid that God's going to hurt you? You're afraid that, that, that God doesn't have your best sister at heart, so you need to take the reins, you need to take the driver's seat, 
You need to take control. Let me tell you what, you're going to be a miserable person. You have an unquenchable thirst and an unquenchable hunger that you'll never have to eat. you got to give it to God. Stand with me right now. Do it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to begin to conclude this service this morning. And, and as we do, I want to give you an opportunity to surrender it to God. And, and I want you to lift up a prayer, something like this, to God today. As you give your heart and your life to God by faith, it's not the words that save you. It is the intent and the meaning. Lift up a prayer, something like this. God, you know my life. I've messed up. I've sinned. I've done wrong. Even when I knew it was wrong. God, save me from my sin. Save me from myself. I give my life to you. Jesus, you loved me and demonstrated that love when you went to the cross and died for me. Died for me, God. For me. Jesus, I thank you for dying in my place to demonstrate that love, for saving me from my sin, for being that sacrifice for me. And because of what you've done for me, God, I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to trust you with my life. So I'm going to give it to you right now, God. It's hard to let it go. It's hard. You know that, though, don't you, Jesus? I can't do this no more can't live this way any longer. So Father, help me to truly surrender myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, then I hope that you'll make that decision public this morning. Just come up and say, Brother Wade, I prayed that with you and I surrendered my heart, my life to Christ. And I'm just going to give you, I'm going to pray with you and then I'm going to tell you the next steps that you need to do to, to deepen your relationship with God. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. But I'm going to ask you, you got to step out and come because Jesus always called his disciples publicly. He said, can I do it here? No, you cannot. Because Jesus called his disciples publicly. If you made that decision, you come on publicly now. Brother Chris is going to play just a moment. The altar is open to you. If you maybe uh, surrendered your life at one time, but now you've taken it back and you want to once again Rededicate. I hate that word. Repent of your sin is the better one. If you want to repent today and come home, come on. Altar's open.